Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Liesl, uh, to another great session. Um, some legal questions and answers today. I will will play host um, and, and put all the questions to Liesl, and she will, with all her knowledge and experience, answer the questions to the best of her ability. Um, just for all of you out there that don't know myself and Liesl, I'm Cor van Deventer from Van Deventer and Van Deventer Incorporated. We have offices in Johannesburg and Cape Town, and we work very closely with Liesl and her firm, Greivensteins. She'll tell you a bit about them, why we're brother and sister, so <laughs> we enjoy working together. Liesl, it's good seeing you again, even though you're in, in Port Elizabeth, um, and over to you. Thank you, Cord. It's always my absolute pleasure and privilege to do something with you. Um, we are so... Yeah, we're so privileged to, to be able to enjoy the same things and to share this passion, especially for the property industry. So thank you for hosting it. You're always the best host. Always um, can be trusted behind the scenes. Yes, so I'm Liesl Greivenstein from Greivenstein Incorporated. We are a large conveyancing firm. We have uh, we act, uh, service every sphere of the law but I focus on conveyancing myself. We've got offices in Johannesburg, Cape Town, Port Elizabeth, and we've been around for 62 years this year. So um, it really is a privilege and an honor for me to, to be with you all. So I'm gonna let you fire away with the questions, Gord. Okay. I think it's so nice when we have a Q&A session because it's it's questions that are asked by, by estate agents and property professionals. So. One always wonders whether you are adding value and whether the topics that you cover are relevant to, to your audience. So it is wonderful answering your questions. So we've got some good questions here, Lisa. Let's start with the first one. Um, something that's popped up quite a bit lately um, regarding capital gains tax. Can you clarify capital gains tax in respect of non-residents? And that two million rent clause in respect of non-residents having to declare something. I'm, I'm sure they're talking about withholding tax there. So if you can just elaborate and, and answer that question for us there, please. So two things are addressed in that question. The first being capital gains tax. Um, but uh, the the person who's on, who's um, asking the question really has uh, this alarm bell called withholding tax has sounded. So. Let's deal with the capital gains tax first. Remember, you pay capital gains tax in South Africa if you are disposing of an asset that is situate, situated in the country, whether you are a South African citizen, um, whether you are a South African resident or a non-resident, doesn't really matter. That disposal triggers capital gains tax, regardless of whether you are, in fact, a registered taxpayer in South Africa or not. So it goes without saying that if you are a non-resident who sells property in South Africa, you cannot claim that 2 million rands primary residence exclusion because you are not ordinarily resident in the country, which means it can never be your primary residence that you are selling. So most definitely, the seller there will face capital gains tax liability. But in addition to that, SARS, of course, want to ensure that if you are liable for capital gains tax and you are not a South African resident, they don't want to go to the trouble of finding you wherever you are in the world. So they introduced what is called withholding tax, which means that if you are a non-resident and you sell property in South Africa, and you sell that for more than two million rands, you have to have a certain percentage of your net proceeds retained, withheld. For natural persons, that percentage is 7.5%. So if you are a non-resident, you sell property with a selling price in excess of 2 million rands, 7.5% of your proceeds must be withheld until such time as you can prove that there is no capital gains tax liability. So that is how SARS will ensure that a certain portion of your proceeds can be withheld until such time as you can prove that there is no liability on that individual to pay capital gains tax. 
if you can just answer the Lisa quickly, just a second part. Whose responsibility is that to withhold the tax um, that that foreigner has to pay? So estate agents will be interested to know that you fall squarely within the ambit of, a of one of those um, responsible authorities. But generally speaking, obviously the onus is on the conveyancer. So the conveyancer must immediately realize that when a non-resident sells for more than 2 million rands, that they will be withholding tax. If the tax is not withheld, and there is a, a responsibility on the seller or the, the, the non-resident to pay withholding tax or to pay capital gains tax, SARS will come looking for the conveyancer. So you suggest it's imperative that uh, estate agents inform the sellers if they're non-residents of this withholding tax? Absolutely, because SARS might just choose to rather go after the estate agent, which they are able to do um, in terms of, of legislation. Okay, next question. I have a seller who is married according to the laws of Taiwan or any other country in, in the world. She is the sole registered owner of the fixed property. She lives in Cape Town, but her husband lives in Taiwan. What do I need to tell her regarding the signature of these transfer documents? So it also addresses quite a couple of issues, so this question. Um, first and foremost, it is wonderful when estate agents realize that right at the outset of a particular transaction that there's something that needs to be done. You might not always know exactly what it is or what steps to follow, but the moment the question is asked, you can at least get the right advice and prevent these enormous delays that occur when estate agents don't advise their clients correctly upfront. It's so embarrassing when those clients come to sign transfer documents at our offices, and I know, Cor, you experience the same, and you have to inform them of something that could have been done a month or two ago when the actual OTP was signed. So hats off to this particular estate agent for asking the question. First of all, in South Africa, if you are married according to the laws of a foreign country, you can understand and appreciate the fact that the deeds office will need to protect the rights, the matrimonial property rights of these spouses that may not even be in the country. So for that reason, if you are married according to the laws of a foreign country, you can acquire rights. In other words, you can purchase property if it's a cash transaction, but you cannot alienate those rights. In other words, bond the property or sell the property without the consent of your spouse. Now that consent, basically means that that spouse to whom this Taiwanese lady is married must sign transfer documents. Now, because those transfer documents are signed abroad and they are necessary for use inside of the Republic of South Africa, there are certain steps um, that need to be followed. And those steps can be found in Rule 63 of the High Court Rules. Basically, it has to do with authentication of, of signatures. Because how is the deeds office going to know, or the conveyancer for that matter in South Africa, how will he or she know that those documents were in fact signed by that spouse that is sitting in Taiwan um, if we don't have a strict procedure in place to authenticate his signature or to validate his signature? So generally speaking, once again, you would have to send a power of attorney by email to the spouse who's sitting in Taiwan, that spouse will have to um, visit the embassy or the consulate, or for some other countries, will just have to uh, consult a notary. And the notary or the, the consulate, depending on, on uh, which official is involved here, will then authenticate his signature. The original will then come back to South Africa and that will then be used or will be used for lodgement purposes at the deeds office. If you can just quickly, Liesl, on that, just elaborate on the Hague Convention and the apostille that we use for some countries. And also the second part of the question, just suggest some tips that the estate agents can use to speed up this process by warning the sellers or purchasers, whichever the case may be. Yeah. So let me just start with the second, uh, your, your second part of the question, Cor, because um, speed is everything. We all know that in this game, um, you snooze, you lose. 
So clients get highly irritated when we don't advise them properly right at the outset. So how do we speed this up? The first thing is when you're dealing with a client, when you do your listing presentation and you establish the, mat uh, the marital uh, regime applicable to, to your client, when you know that there's a spouse that is sitting abroad who is going to have to sign documents, contact the conveyancer immediately so that we can draft a power of attorney right there and then and email it to the client because it takes weeks, sometimes months for them to get an appointment with a notary or at the embassy. So how to speed it up is to make sure that you are switched on so that you advise your client right at the outset when you do that, that listing presentation. And secondly, to elaborate a little bit on the Hague Convention, there are certain countries in the world who are signatories to the Hague Convention. It's basically a kind of a treaty that has been signed by, by several countries. If your country, South Africa is a, is a signatory to the Hague Convention. So if your country is a signatory to the Hague Convention, we just attach what we call an apostille to that power of attorney and a notary or anybody can sign, anybody charged with authentication of documents can then sign that. If your country is not a signatory to the Hague Convention, you have to follow the, the embassy steps. In other words, you have to make an appointment at the embassy and some countries have further rules and regulations that will involve the High Court, for example. So it's definitely easier if that particular country is a signatory to the Hague Convention. So you would suggest with COVID in some countries going through lockdowns, especially countries like China, USA is open for estate agents to inform sellers exactly regarding the process going forward and the delay. Absolutely. Especially when, when there are link transfers, when it's subject to sale and all of for that. For sure, for sure, because it will impact your deal. So the best is to contact the conveyancer right at the outset and uh, get the conveyancer to establish whether that particular country is a signatory to the Hague Convention, and if not, what steps should then be followed? Okay, next question. I wonder if it would be possible just to discuss the negative aspects um, regarding purchasing a property in a business's name. We are getting queries from clients um, that insist on buying property in a business's name, but does not normally make sense. Can you just please inform us of the negative aspects and, and what you would suggest going forward, what to tell clients that really want to buy that property in the business's name? So I know exactly why this question is asked and structured in such a way that the person who's asking the question is actually wanting me to, to just highlight the negative aspects. What you or she is referring to um, as a business uh, I think they mean a legal entity. In other words, a trust, a company, or a close corporation. Usually when agents encounter buyers who want to buy an illegal entity, they want to advise them not to do so because we are not always comfortable with the terminology and the legal aspects when it comes to these business entities. There's absolutely no reason to be afraid or to be uncomfortable. Um, I'm going to first of all highlight the the positive score, because I think it's very important that we as estate agents don't just go out and say to clients, it's not advisable to buy an illegal entity. Yes, there are negative aspects, especially when it comes to capital gains tax, but there are many positives as well. And for you to simply uh, say that it's, that it's not advisable or not beneficial means that you don't understand the positive aspects around that. So let's look at the advantages first. When you buy something in a legal entity, it does not form part of your personal estate. Now, we all know that if your personal estate exceeds three and a half million rands in net value when you die, 20% of that excess is paid to SARS as estate duty. So you can imagine that the wealthy would most certainly be looking at buying property in a separate legal entity so as to keep the net value of their estate under the 3.5 million rands threshold. So you can 
definitely not say to a client that it's not advisable. There are many clients who already have the net asset value in their estates um, exceed three and a half million rand. So that's the one advantage. The second advantage also has to do with the fact that it doesn't form part of your personal estate. And that lies in the fact that if there is a sequestration, for example, of an individual, assets that are held by that individual, and I'm using that term loosely, but assets that are controlled by that individual in a separate legal entity do not form part of his personal estate. So it cannot be attached by creditors, for example. So it is a good way of safeguarding family assets uh, against a, a sequestration in your personal capacity. So there definitely are very valid reasons for wanting to buy property in a separate legal entity. The one disadvantage is that when you sell that property, you cannot make use of the 2 million rands primary residence exclusion because a legal entity cannot own a primary residence. And also the inclusion rate for capital gains tax is 80% versus 40% if it's in your personal capacity. So in other words, for a trust, a company or a, a close corporation, 80% of the gain is added to the taxable income for that particular legal entity for that year of assessment. So that is the advantage. You don't make, you can't make use of the 2 million rands primary residence exclusion and the inclusion rate is 80% versus the 40% for a private individual. Um, surety, Liesl, when, when you sign documents, we all sign for, for all the banks and all of that. Um, surety, do most banks require surety from the directors, shareholders, Absolutely. members or trustees? Yes, so estate agents often get confused and not just estate agents, clients in general don't often realise that when you buy in the name of a trust, for example, if you are a man married in community of property, you cannot buy in your personal capacity without involving your spouse. But if you act on behalf of a trust in your capacity as a trustee, you don't need the assistance of your spouse because you are acting in an official capacity. You're not binding the joint estate. But the banks will 99,99% of the time require personal surety ships to be signed by the trustees if we're looking at a trust. That means that every trustee must in his personal capacity sign surety. That in turn means that the spouse will have to consent or be a part of that personal surety because now you are in fact binding the joint estate. And just lastly on this question, Lisa, then we'll move on. If they had to apply in the business's name, in your experience also when you're signing these documents, are the banks requiring deposits if it's in the business's name um, or are they giving 100% bonds? Look, it all depends on the jockey. We always say 100% bond for a trust is certainly not impossible, but it will all depend on the financials. Are there up-to-date audited financials for that particular legal entity? Can you prove affordability? All of those things will, will play a role. Has the entity been trading or is it basically just a shell with no other assets? Um, so the banks will look at all of that and it's certainly not as easy as to just look at a salaried employee as a private individual um, and to prove affordability. So absolutely possible, but definitely more onerous. Good, thank you on that. Okay, next question. A client has asked me what happens if someone dies and they don't have a will. She has been told that the bank will take the property and the master of the high court will have the right to sell it and service all the creditors. Hmm. Okay, so when you die without a will in South Africa, and we've just had wills week, so when you die without a will, somebody um, should have given you a, a, a slap, I think, during your lifetime because wills are drafted for free and um, it is the one thing I think in life, one of very few that is still that is still drafted for you for free. But if you die without a will, we call your estate uh, an interstate estate. So in other words, 
Without the directives that are given in the will by the testator, certain other rules must come into play. And those rules are found in the Interstate Succession Act. So we actually have an act that governs all of this. So there's certainly no truth to the rumor that the bank will take your assets and the master will just simply sell it. But there is a big proviso. Remember, if you have made use of bond financing when you purchased that home during your lifetime, the bank in any event has security. The bank is a secured creditor. So no matter whether you are alive or dead, if the bond installments are not serviced or paid every month, the bank has all the right to foreclose and to sell that property in execution to settle the debt. So that's not a new thing. And that is that doesn't come into play only when you die. That's always been the case. So if the heirs of um, this person who died interstate without a will, if those heirs can't service the bond or the, the surviving spouse, for example, can't service the bond, the bank will foreclose as they would have if the person was still alive and simply just didn't pay his bond. Now, the master of the high court um, is the body that governs all deceased estates and also um, insolvent estates. So the master's involvement will always be there when you die, whether it was with a will or without a will, the master is involved. So the master will then appoint an executor on advice or on nomination by the heirs usually, and that executor will be the person who will have to wind up the estate, uh, will have to wind up the estate and who will have to report to the master um, on an ongoing basis until the estate has been successfully wound up. I know you guys also do a lot of estates and estate transfers at, in, in PE Cape Town Diesel. So if you can maybe just inform the agents also that are all online now um, regarding the problems that there currently are, um, the Department of Justice and the Master of the High Court and the delays that we are experiencing at the moment regarding estate transfers. I know it's a big problem. So, so the master's office nationwide has become the latest victim of um, what do you call it, Cor? When you when they hack you hacking and hacking or well ransom, ransomware. Yeah. That's what they call it. So, there's been many rumours uh, going around, um, some ranging from uh, an amount of thirty three billion dollars that have been. Um, claimed as as ransomware to release all this information. I actually read a letter that was issued by the Department of Justice on Thursday last week, where that has been denied. Apparently, no money has been has been um, requested, no ransom. So nobody knows. Bottom line is the master's office has been offline for the last couple of weeks, and the end is certainly not in sight. Now, what this means for you as estate agents is if any one of your deals is linked to an estate transfer or to a deal where a property has been sold out of an estate, we are now stuck. Because remember, if property is sold from an estate, the master has to consent to that sale. And that happens by way of an endorsement, a stamp that is actually um brought onto the power of attorney, which the master must stamp the power of attorney for the conveyancer before that deal can proceed. So you can only imagine the frustration that is currently experienced because there are just so many deals who are just hanging. Um, banks are, of course, keeping a keen eye on the situation because we all know that the bank reserves the right to reassess your credit position um, just before lodgement. So with all these delays and people being being affected by lockdown and just the economy as a whole, a lot can happen when your deal is delayed by three to six months, even longer. So it does so affect all of us. So you'd suggest that agents out there keep up to date with what's going on, going onto your website, and also just speaking to the conveyance as a whole, even if it's not Ravenstein's or Van Deventer's, just to follow up and keep purchases up to date. Absolutely, because if you're not going to, to lead your purchaser, I mean, the, the worst thing for me is 
when you know that you're dealing with a buyer who has to take occupation by a certain date. And now, all of a sudden, there's an estate involved. Um, the, the seller is a deceased estate, for example, and the buyer has absolutely no idea that this transfer is going to take um, in excess of six months, for example. He is going to be furious when the conveyancer explains to him that this could have been prevented if the estate agent had just kept him informed. And it's not because the estate agent doesn't want to, to keep his client informed. It's sometimes just the fact that we are that we ourselves don't stay up to date with with the current happenings and goings on stay keep staying in or being informed <laughs> so the next question we've got here Liesl, are sellers who are married in community of property the wife is in a frail care facility and has alzheimer's that is an at an advanced stage she signed a power of attorney in favor of her husband years before she, she got sick. Uh, the agent now has an offer on this property, which the husband has accepted. What should I tell my buyers about delays and how long should they make the offer irrevocable and open for acceptance? I think the first one to deal with is the power of attorney and what... Yeah. Mm. You know, while you're reading that question, I'm thinking of so many estate agents who, who are facing this exact problem. Now, the first and probably most important point to make here is when somebody signs a power of attorney, granting somebody else the power or the authorization to sign on their behalf, that person must be lucid and must obviously understand what it is that they are signing. So that, that is perfectly understandable. What many agents still don't realize is that when you want to execute on that power of attorney. In other words, when the husband now, years after the wife giving him power of attorney, if he now wants to sign transfer documents on her behalf and she has Alzheimer's at an advanced stage and she is no longer lucid, he cannot use that power of attorney. That power of attorney is invalid if the person who granted you the right to sign on his or her behalf is no longer lucid. So that's the very important point for all of us to understand. Many clients still come to us on a daily basis, and I'm convinced that you have the same core, where they say to us, my parents are getting old. They are moving into a frail care facility. I want you to please draft a power of attorney so that I'm able to sign documents on my parents' behalf should they no longer have the capacity to enter into contracts or the capacity to act, to act in general. And then we have to explain to them, we can draft that power of attorney, which your parents can sign now if they are lucid, but the minute they are no longer, um, they no longer have the capacity to, to contract or to act, you cannot use that power of attorney. Use of that power of attorney at that stage will be unlawful. So that's the first important point. If you now get into a situation where the parents now have to, the, the husband was still looking after the wife. Look what I did there. The husband was taking care of the wife. Um, and now he also needs to move into a frail care facility. If that is the case, and they now have to sell their home, because obviously, what do they live off? And this is what, what clients say to us all the time. We simply cannot afford to, to maintain our parents and, and to provide for them. So we have to sell their house for them to have money to pay for their monthly expenses at the frail care facility. And unfortunately, the law doesn't look at the facts and, and doesn't take into account the level of desperation. What must happen is the children or the family members will have to approach an attorney in order to get what we call a curator appointed for that particular person who can no longer act. So whether there is a power of attorney that was signed or whether there is absolutely no power of attorney doesn't matter. A curator needs to be appointed and only the High Court can appoint a curator with the assistance of the, with the involvement of the master, but the High Court appoints a curator and that process must be driven by the family, costs anywhere between 30 and 50,000 rand, and 
takes anywhere between three and six months for that curator to be appointed. So once again, uh, look at what the situation is. Remember what we discussed here and then approach your attorneys or, or anybody else to assist you. <laughs> then the last question is, I'll be running out of time. <laughs> it's, sure. gone so, it's gone so quickly. Um, let's see here. My buyers have signed transfer and bond documents and it has only now come to light that the anti-nuptial contract was never registered by the attorneys or the notaries at, at that stage. Is this a problem and how do they solve it? Okay, so yes, it is a problem. Uh, in our country, you are only married out of community of property if an anti-nuptial contract was executed or signed in the presence of a notary and registered in a deeds office. Now, the, the problem is, we call it an anti-nuptial contract, like antenatal clauses. It is before an event. You cannot just simply enter into a post-nuptial contract and have that enforceable. The anti-nuptial contract must be signed before you actually got married even if it's seconds before. So if you realize that the anti-nuptial contract was not registered um, and now you're already married, you are married in community of property. So what must happen under these circumstances is the notary who was responsible to have your anti-nuptial contract registered must now apply to the High Court on your behalf to have the, the contract registered post nuptially. So in other words, it's, it'll be easy to prove what the terms of that agreement were because the, the agreement was signed, um, the intention between the parties are clear, between the spouses, it was just not registered in the deeds office. So one must then apply to the High Court for an order uh, granting the deeds office the authority to register that contract that you signed before you got married to register that after, after the, the marriage. Again, high court application, you are looking at, again, between 30 and 50,000 Rand, but obviously the notary who was, or the conveyancer who was responsible for the registration of that anti-nuptial contract will have to come to the party. Can you just discuss the creditor's consent also in this application? Is I think it's quite important, yes. especially if they were married in community of property and now want to change the matrimonial property system. Mm. So that is why you have to advertise um, before this uh, order can be granted, because you must be able to show that no creditors will be prejudiced. Because remember, it is easy for somebody who um, owes a lot of money, let's again use the wife as the example, if the wife, for example, owes a lot of money uh, and creditors were under the impression that she was married to her husband in community of property, meaning that the, the joint estate would be liable for, for all these, um, for, for all this credit or all this debt, to now go and uh, just simply apply, if it was easy to just apply to have this anti-nuptial contract registered post-nuptially, that would prejudice creditors because they were under the impression that no anti-nuptial contract was registered. So she's married in community of property. Now she wants to argue that her husband cannot be held liable because they are married out of community of property. So it's just a simple illustration of how creditors could be prejudiced and why it is necessary to, in your application, show that you have advertised and that creditors don't object. So in short, use notaries that won't forget to register your anti-nuptial contract. <laughs> I'm just going to throw this last question in this year, Liesl. We've come across this quite a bit, and I'm sure you're also on that side. Um, where sellers are in the process of, of getting divorced or purchasing on, on the flip side, and that's come across so many times again, um, husband and wife are in the process of getting divorced and they want to sell or they're in the process and they want to, their wife wants to purchase a property um, to move out of the marital home. I think the second uh, example is probably more prevalent, Gaur, because we often have a situation where spouses, soon to be ex-spouses, the one needs to leave the, the common home and for that purpose, uh, he or she 
will obviously want to secure alternative accommodation by purchasing property. Now, if you are married out of community of property without the accrual system being applicable and your uh, divorce settlement agreement has been signed, nothing really stands in your way because you have full contractual capacity without the assistance of your spouse because you are married out of community of property and you can basically, if you need bond financing, you need to show affordability, et cetera, et cetera, but you can carry on. The problem comes in where these spouses are still married to each other in community of property. I always remind agents that in South Africa, we don't, um, we don't acknowledge legal separation. There is no such thing. I know um, people still praat van van bed en tafel gesky and they haven't been living together for the last 10, 15 years. Without a divorce order, you are still married, which means if there was no anti-nuptial contract, you are still married in community of property. That means it is impossible for you to purchase property whilst still married in community of property because there's still one joint estate that um, hasn't been dissolved. So under those circumstances, if there's a family member, sometimes a parent who has a trust or a separate legal entity, um, once again, that creates a great opportunity for this spouse who is in the process of getting divorced to buy property if there is this the separate legal entity because um, she doesn't need the involvement of the spouse or he doesn't need the involvement of the spouse to whom he's married in community of property. Just lastly, Lisa, I know this question also comes up. The sellers, if the husband and wife are in the process of getting divorced, we get this as well. How do you, as the conveyance, ensure that those payments are done according to the divorce order or according, because well, some spouses always say they're scared the husband's going to take 100% of the proceeds and then leave the country. How would yeah, you as the conveyance, what do they sign um, with you, um, documents that they sign with you to ensure that it's paid into the correct accounts? So we will never pay out, not even occupational rent. We will never pay, make payment of any sum uh, of money without a signed authority to pay. In other words, both spouses, if they both own the home, they're co-owners, both of them must sign an authority to pay, indicating the bank account they want to receive the proceeds in, et cetera, et cetera. If there's a court order or a signed settlement agreement, of course, it makes it a little bit easier because then you can verify that. You can verify the intention of the parties. But in the absence of a court order, both owners must sign an authority to pay and they must clearly identify the bank account into which they will accept payment. Thanks for a great session, Liesl. It, it's gone very quickly, the time. Unfortunately, the time is limited. I'm sure myself and you could spend hours chatting like this and, and answering questions. It's always fun uh, being with you online. I really enjoy it. From myself, Paul van Deventer, to everybody out there, thank you for, for being online and, and listening. I always say knowledge is power. So go out, use this knowledge and, and have a fantastic end of the year we're almost there it's crazy to think about that but what you do now will will set up your your next year in 2022 so thank you from van deventer van deventer and liesel over to you no just it's been great Cor. thank you very much and well done to each and everybody who has been listening to these training sessions and webinars i couldn't agree more with you Cor. knowledge is power and it also gives us that confidence that that we that we need because it's such a such a competitive environment that we all operate in and if you're not going to know a little bit more than the person next to you well uh, that's a choice so well done to each and everybody for listening and it's been an absolute pleasure thank you Cor, for hosting thank you Liesl, and thank you everybody out there we really appreciate it